it's out of Famous Pixel, and today I bring you the BenQ EX3210U gaming monitor. I've had about a week and a half with it so far. First off, I want to send thank I want to send BenQ a huge thank you for sending this over to me for review. Um, but note that all of my opinions, both for my benefit, your benefit, and BenQ's benefit, are going to be completely honest. It's to nobody's benefit for me to just promote something blind, blindly without offering you a good unbiased pros and cons of it, which I'm going to be doing, okay? Um, but, spoiler alert, this is a pretty awesome monitor. So, also, take into account that I have been a huge fan and a big supporter of BenQ products for a very long time, okay? This is one of the reasons why I support them on my channel. All of the monitors in my studio, from my monitoring monitor, from my cameras, to my productivity monitor that I use with my with my MacBook at my desk, to my main gaming monitor, which is the BenQ XR3501, which I've had for years and I still have to this day. I love it to death. These are all BenQ products. I, I've kind of come to expect a certain level of quality and reliability from their products, um, which definitely resonates into the EX3210U as well, okay? So I'm gonna give you a full overview, the pros and the cons, I'm gonna walk you through everything you can come to expect from this monitor, and I'm gonna make some recommendations and suggestions in the end as well. And we're gonna start with the display. The, the BenQ EX3210U is a 4K 144Hz monitor. So yes, it supports HDMI 2.1. In fact, it's got two HDMI 2.1s in the back. I'll give you more details on that after. But yeah, that's that's both a necessity and uh, and a very nice to have as far as that goes. As far as that goes with with BenQ, um, it also has a 98% DCI-P color gamut, which is not only excellent for gaming and for good quality gaming as far as that's concerned, but this pushes it into the productivity headspace as well, because I'm an artist, I'm a video producer, and I'm a gamer. So having very, very reliable, very high level of color fidelity is something that's very important for my particular line of work. I'm an artist. I do video production. I need to. I need accuracy. Albeit, of course, I'm always going to calibrate my monitors, but it's nice to know that I'm getting the most reliable image right out of the gate as far as that goes, okay? And I'm gonna talk all about color, color specs and all that kind of thing moving forward as well, okay? Um, so yeah, so you're getting a very large, very immersive, very highly detailed image quality as far as that goes. And when it comes to the actual gaming experience, well, that's the first thing I wanna mention. This is first and foremost a gaming monitor it is designed to look like and behave like and cater to a gamer. And BenQ are very smart with this. They know what to add in and what to sacrifice or how to tweak their hardware for the best gaming experience from the perspective of a gamer. One of the things you might notice when you look at the specs is it's only got a thousand to one contrast ratio, which is not significant. If you look at a MacBook, that's a million to one contrast ratio. I reviewed a gaming projector from them recently, which is a 500,000 to one contrast ratio. So you're sitting there going, yeah. Now it's an IPS panel, of course, but um, what does that mean in terms of gaming? Well, uh, in terms of gaming, what I actually found was when playing games, you get a greater sense of visibility. You feel like you're not pushed too far into the darks or pushed too high into the lights, where visibility, especially with a fast-paced moving, moving image, starts to become problematic. Playing games like Elden Ring, which you can see right over here, or Dark Souls, Bloodborne, even playing games like uh, Ori and the, and the Will of the Wisps or Blind Forest, you can sometimes get lost in the dark, especially in areas that are very, very dark with lower contrast. You're kind of sitting there going, okay, I have to use my torch all the time. It kind of gets on your nerves. I don't find that so much the case because it kind of pushes the lower values and the higher values more into a neutral zone where your eyes can see those details a lot more. I found that really, really nice. The other thing I found very impressive about this monitor is despite the fact that I'm on, on an aged graphic card, I actually owned a, an RTX 3080 at one point, but I returned it because it wasn't compatible with my PC for whatever reason, it was causing me issues. I went back, I reverted back to my GTX 1070, which I still have in my PC to this day, and I saw zero screen tearing. You're look, I'm looking up the image this fast. I'm doing a lot of fast side-scrolling games like Ori, like platforming. I was playing Metal Gear, Phantom Pain, with a lot of camera whips and movements. It was butter smooth footage, which is really nice on the eyes. And I can imagine this being something that's very agreeable for people who might, who might have migraines and stuff like that, where the flicker might cause a bit of an issue. It was 
even compared to my 144Hz XR3501, an arguably smoother feeling experience. So the 4K just adds that extra level of detail to it, and it performed perfectly with an older graphic card. So that's something definitely to take into account in your case, if you're looking into something like this. Now that said, one of the things I wanted to mention is because this is a larger display, and arguably laterally around the same size as the XR3501, which is also a very big monitor, but in this particular case, it actually has vertical height to it as well, which the 3501 doesn't have. A bit of a curve, would have been nice. So what that means is, because you're looking far off to the side, it's always adjusting itself to the distance of your eyes. So you always feel like you have an even viewing distance from all angles. And on the e on the EX3210U, because it's such a large monitor, especially if you're closer to it, you really feel like you're looking off to the sides of the corner, and it almost makes the monitor, especially if you're used to an ultra-wide monitor, it makes it feel a little bit convex, where it feels like it's bulging in the middle and pushing out on the sides. Now, of course it's not, it's a perfectly flat panel, but I think for a monitor that big, it, it should almost become a prerequisite to add at least a bit of a curve to it so you don't feel like you're looking off to the side of the corners. Once you're in the game, you're immersed in it, you're actually in this very big, immersive 32-inch uh, uh, space. So you're really more focused in the, on the middle of the display. But when you do look off to the sides, once you've gotten your eyes used to a curved monitor, it's definitely something you're going to notice. The other thing you want to take into account as well is if you're in a brighter room, if your office or your or your room is is bright, you've got big windows, you've got bright lights and stuff like that. Notice that note that the peak brightness on this and I have this currently set to its max brightness is 600 nits, which is not a lot as far as that goes. Now, for me gaming and playing on it right now, I've got this big big soft box right now that's shining right on it. I feel it's perfectly viewable. I think it's great. I don't think it's too dark at all. If you have super bright setting, perhaps this might start to become an issue. I don't personally feel that's an issue at all, but there are many other gaming monitors out there that definitely have a very much higher peak brightness. This would be considered lower on the peak brightness is concerned, but definitely something to take into account. So if you have, let's say a 700 nits gaming monitor and you find that it's a little bit dark when the, when a bright light's shining in your studio, that's definitely something to take into account. Now, let's talk about the stand itself. In classic BenQ fashion, it's it's got a it's got a confident and delicately aggressive design. It's definitely caters more to a gamer. It's got the nice diagonal lines, a nice kind of aggressive sign to it as far as that's concerned. It's got a little bit of an orange accent along the bottom. In my particular use case, I like that. Even the 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 XR3501 has little subtle orange accents in the stand as well. But I have orange decor. I have my all my paintings on the wall are different uh, different types of sepias and oranges and yellows. So it matches my decor perfectly. If you're somebody who prefers more neutral, that might be an eyesore for you, albeit orange tends to be a little bit more of a neutral color, kind of like blues and oranges are more neutral. So your mileage may vary as far as that goes. I personally find it's perfectly fine. Uh, and it's a fully adjustable. So vertically up to 100 millimeters in height. It pivots sideways, which I won't do because I've got cables connected. It also tilts in both directions. It is a fully adjustable stand as far as that goes. And it's a nice elegant stand that's designed for cleanliness and cable management, which I'll get to in a second. But um, it's great for that. However, I, if you look at the footage, uh, I had to, I have it on my Grove made uh, monitor stand. And a lot of you might to bring the monitor more up to height might actually have a monitor stand. Take into account that the size of this stand is in my opinion, excessively big. And not only that, the way it's designed is, it's, it sits its weight on the back, right on the back of the stand, and then the two legs come out and there's actually space underneath. So it's actually putting, it's like a tripod, it's putting weight on the three corners over here. And I can actually slip my fingers underneath here, which is good for cable management. If you've got like my home pod, I can slip the wire underneath it. But um, I cannot sit it on my stand without the legs sticking out. Because if I move it too far back, it, because it's sitting on the back, rubberized back of the stand itself, it'll fall off, it'll fall backwards. So I have to keep it forward so it sits on the stand, which forces the front legs to stick at the end of it a little bit. I don't, I don't think that was necessary to make it that big. I, I think that excessively large stands, and I've had, I've, I've, I've used other stands in the past that also did this. I'm not a big fan of that because that eats up a lot of your desk real estate. You have the stand coming halfway across your desk as far as that goes. And I don't think it was necessary because the XR3501, for instance, is 
laterally and in terms of its weight even feels a little heavier than this. This is actually remarkably light for its size. Um, I don't think it was necessarily have something that big and I think it would be more compatible with more people's monitor stands which I'm, sh which I'm sure a lot of people would use. That said, the design is nice and if you do, if you are putting it flat on your desk, you shouldn't run into this issue. Now that said, um, one of the things I'm really happy they've done with this, which they didn't do with my ultra wide monitor, is um, they made it VESA compatible. So thank you. <laughs> I'm a big fan of VESA mounts. I generally put my, my monitors on VESA mounts. I found it a real limitation that the XR3501 didn't. It forced it, it forced me to have to use that stand as far as that went. So the fact that I can actually mount this on a nice VESA and because the, the actual monitor itself is not excessively heavy, you shouldn't have to buy some super expensive, super robust one. Of course, look up the specs to make sure you get one that's compatible with the, the, the which can handle the weight of it. But I love the fact that this is VESA compatible. I think that's gonna make it accessible to a lot more people. Now, a nice to have and something that at first I went, ugh, that's gimmicky, who cares, right? But I actually ended up using it. And that is the fact that they've implemented sound, both speakers and a mic into the monitor itself, which you might not think is a very big deal. But I realized something. I, I've made my main setup is my MacBook setup, which I have um, over there. So what I ended up doing because it's, I have my PC for gaming and I have my Mac for productivity, I need my productivity setup more often. I hooked my desktop speakers up to my Mac. So I would have to redo the, the cable management in my studio if I wanted to hook it up to my PC again, which isn't worth it. So I just ended up hooking up my amp so I could get some kind of sound. So when I wanted to listen to my PC, if I was playing a game, I would put on my headphones through the amp. But um, as soon as I set it up, I realized, oh crap, I don't have speaker set up. And I was like, oh no, I don't want to have to set up my speakers into my PC. No, not again. And then I realized it has speakers in it and I needed to test them out anyways for the review. So I was like, right. So I just, as soon as you plug it in, there's an extra cable you connect into the back. You just connect it and you have speakers that play out through the back. And it's the, the, the sound is by a company called Trivolo. Okay. How is the sound? Well, if you're looking for desktop sound, and I'm a bit of an audiophile, so I've got really good headphones and speakers and stuff like that. No, it's not desktop sound. If you really want booming sound coming out of your, coming out of your sound system, hook it up to a pair of desktop speakers, obviously. But it ain't bad. I was for, especially for IPS monitors, because they're so thin, generally the first thing to take a hit is the speaker quality it's actually not too bad. So it's got sound coming out of the back, but it's also got front firing speakers as well. It's a 2.1 sound, sound system as far as that goes. And it's good. The volume is not excessively loud. I think if they got any louder, it would actually kind of, kind of create some kind of clipping or something like that. It's perfectly usable. So watching YouTube videos, watching Netflix, uh, just standard content and stuff like that, perfectly usable. The mic itself, um, I haven't actually tested it myself, but I recommend going out and checking out some reviews online. I recommend the review by This Is E, um, Isgrin. He has a very good review where he actually gives a demo of the mic itself, and it's not bad. You know, so if you're if you're if you're doing a Skype call or if you're on Zoom or something like that, and you don't have access to a mic and speakers, this will definitely pass. It's passable. It's perfectly good for gaming. You know, if you're not looking for anything groundbreaking, but if you're really looking for good quality sound, get yourself a nice pair of headphones or a nice speaker system and plug that into your desktop. Of course, that's going to be the ideal situation. Next, I want to talk about the on-screen controls and the color settings. Thank you, BenQ. I I think every company, every company should have a remote when it comes to their on-screen display. Nobody ever enjoys these stupid finicky little buttons underneath, albeit. I think that the design has a nice gamer appeal to it, and I think that the menus are very... BenQ always does a really good job of making nice intuitive menu buttons. You can find your way around and you can figure out the system very, very easily. And they're easy, they're tactile. Every button kind of has its own little feeling to it. Some protrude a little bit more, so you can tell which one is the joystick button versus the input button versus, for instance, the mute mic button, which you have right in the front, okay? Um, uh, it's good. And I think the design of the layout is nice and intuitive. It feels, even the display has a quality design element to it. It doesn't look like, like some cheap tacked on, as I like to call it, programmer art type of look to it. Um, so that's great, but I'll definitely grab a remote and I find it so much more convenient just to grab my remote, change my settings go into the menu, 
flick through. It's so much easier to do that. So when I want to change the settings, I don't want to fiddle with these stupid buttons. I just go click the corresponding button and change it right there. So that's definitely a huge pro. Uh, and you can even change your source buttons. However, they have a bunch of these different color settings, which I can see might appeal to the gamer, but I'm not a huge fan of what they've done with the naming conventions, not to mention the color settings themselves. The standard out of the box color setting is the only one I would use either for gaming or for productivity. Uh, having a 98% DCI-P color gamut, uh, it's excellent color quality right out of the gate. As soon as you switch it into these other modes, which are named by the way, RPG, FPS, racing game, they name them this, like they're intended for those particular use cases. I find they're terribly calibrated and it basically takes the, the, the saturation, the contrast and the, and the dynamic range. It just, it's like a disable quality buttons. I wouldn't have used, I wouldn't use any of those gamer settings. I just sit it straight on standard. And as far as the color setting, the standard color setting, um, I stick it to sRGB done. That's it. Now on the Mac, they actually have an implemented color setting called M book for Macs. And I tried it and I went, no, no, definitely not. Especially if you're not coming from a Mac monitor, like terrible. Again, sRGB. I just stuck it on sRGB, standard color mode. I wouldn't change any of those color modes. I think they're terrible. You can of course manually correct some of the color settings to tweak it to your particular liking. And of course use a calibrator if you're doing productivity on it. But yeah, anything but the standard sRGB color settings I don't think are at all good. I'm sure that's something they could update with a firmware or a software update. Um, but yeah, I'm not a big fan. I would much rather have DCI-P or have sRGB and just stick with those recognizable color settings so I know what to expect. It's these are This is nomenclature that I'm familiar with as a user. And most gamers should usually be familiar with this stuff as well. Now, I wanna talk about ports, both which ports you have access to on the BenQ, uh, on the EX3210U, as well as accessibility to these ports, the actual physical being able to access these ports. Um, so what BenQ wanted to do essentially, remember this is intended for gamers and in my opinion, really intended for a permanent setup, kind of. I'm a bit confused about this one because what they have in the back, which I really, really like is two HDMI 2.1 ports, which is excellent because I have a portable MacBook Pro and I have a permanent desktop PC, which I built myself. And having access to two, HDMI 2.1 ports means I can just hit this little source button. I can plug, I can have my MacBook plugged in the side and I can switch back and forth between gaming and productivity, Mac versus PC with a single touch of a button, which I think is really nice. It's nice to not have to go back into the back of the monitor and plug and unplug things whenever I want to change my setups. I love that feature as well. It has a mic input for standard headphones. Again, if you're an audiophile, you want to get yourself a good DAC and amp or an all-in-one like the THX 788, which I love. Uh, or 789 um, and hook that up as your more permanent high quality mic uh, uh, headphone setup. But if you just have a pair of standard headphones, like I've got my Audio Technicas over here, you just have one little, you have a 3.5, you plug it in the back, very convenient. As well, you have access to a uh, display port. Note that the display port will give you higher refresh rate, but it will disable the audio out of it if you're using the actual built-in speakers. And lastly, you have four HDMI 3.0, which is great for charging, giving you actually more connectivity. That eight more ports to me is things that I always love because I connect all kinds of peripherals into my stuff. So having access to those ports is great. So I really appreciate that. Now, from a MacBook user's perspective, it would have been really nice to have a USB-C, particularly in 2022. <laughs> Just saying, the fact that I can both plug in my, my laptop and charge it through a USB-C port is highly convenient for a MacBook user. Uh, it's not the end of the world. You can connect it via HDMI. It's not the end of the world. Um, but, you know, it would be nice to have. And in most modern monitors, I think it should be a prereq prerequisite. So the fact that the USB-C is missing is a bit of a rub as far as that goes. So yeah, but that's not the biggest rub. And I think one of the things that I really, that I really want to to nail BenQ to the wall for, they did this, they, this is this is one of my biggest pet peeves when it came to the XR3501. And it's again, the same issue. In fact, it's even worse on the EX3210U. Accessibility to these ports is horrible. It's horrible. 
It's not only bad to the point where it's hard to reach back there, it's bad to the point where the only way you can access these ports is to physically take it away from the wall, turn it around, flip it down on the back, and look for it and plug it in. I mean, every, the fact that you, that you gave us access to four USB 3.0 ports, but I can't for the life of me find them and reach back there because it's you have to kind of squeeze it in through this back port is really, really bad design in my opinion. And I understand why they did it. They did it because they want to make the cleanest setup. They all plug in, you put the panel on top of it, so they all sit flush and all of the cables fit through right through the base itself. So you can't even see the cables. It makes for a nice clean setup if it's a permanent setup. But if somebody's trying to reach those four HDMI 3.0, they're not going to keep things permanently plugged in there most of the time if they want to charge or connect something else via USB 3.0. Well, forget about it, right? And if I wanted to unplug or if I don't want a bunch of excess of cables that are dangling out there and I just wanted to plug things in at my own convenience, it literally requires me to take it off the wall, turn it around, flip it down on a nice soft surface, pull off the panel, reach in the back so I can find it and locate it. On top of it, to make it worse, the way that they've labeled these different ports confided you can see, once you've flipped over the thing you can see it right but if you're just trying to look at the back panel and see what ports what they've made it almost invisible because it's a very small very delicate little emboss in the back of the white panel and you literally it's almost like trying to find a fossil where you have to take your i literally have had to use my flashlight and put it on the side and shine it to find the shadow and go oh okay that's display port I've even, at certain points with my XR3501, uh, literally had to put my camera on face cam and stick it underneath the thing so I could see the port so I could actually line up my port. It was an incredibly involved process of doing that. Again, if you're setting things up permanently, you're plug and play, you've got a nice clean setup, great. But I'm sure they can do better <laughs> because I I'm really not a fan of the way. It's nice to be able to just turn it around, plug something in and forget about it. I would sacrifice a little I would sacrifice a little bit of clean for a lot more convenience as far as that goes. Now, I have to say this with a grain of salt because on the back, if you are looking at the back of this display, you do want it to be a clean design and they've actually implemented some nice LED lighting in the back. 9 out of 10 people are going to have this against a wall. It's just like the, you know, the the IMAX, the 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 2021 IMAX that had multi different colors. The most beautiful part of that display is the side of the display nobody's ever going to see because it's facing the wall. So if you do have this in the middle of the room, if people can get physically behind the monitor, if you're at a gaming convention and the people are playing gaming, you can always locate the EX3210Us because it's got that cool cross LED uh, uh, RGB thing in the back. That's great. But I would personally have, have really sacrificed that for something else. <laughs> I don't think it's a necessary design element. It looks nice. It's gamery. Nine out of 10 people are never going to even see that because it's facing the wall. So yeah. Now, as far as final thoughts and recommendations for gaming and even for productivity, the huge real estate, the beautiful image quality, the complete and utter lack of screen tearing. And we're talking about the smoothest gaming experience you're ever going to have, even on an older graphic card, like a 1070. I think they did a beautiful job. The 98% DCI-P color gamut makes it an excellent choice for for art, albeit do take into account that the contrast ratio can be a hit or miss, especially if you're comparing this to something like a, a Mac, like an iPhone uh, display or something like that, that definitely has a higher contrast ratio. Although I don't think it's an issue and I found it an absolute pleasure. Video editing in Final Cut on this monitor. I was like, whoa, <laughs> you have so much timeline to work with. You can scale your 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 UI elements to your, to your personal liking. Uh, and gaming on this thing is an absolute pleasure. It really is designed for gaming. Albeit, I would stick with the standard color, sRGB. I would make sure that the brightness always is up at its max at 600 nits. Um, and depending on your personal preference with regards to contrast, with regards to deep blacks, if you're used to different monitors, even compared to the XR3501, that's subjective. That really comes up to your personal taste. In my particular case, I found it I found it quite, uh, quite um, nice. I found it quite agreeable as far as that goes, both for PS5 and for PC. For productivity, I'm definitely going to be connecting this to my Mac. I think it makes, it makes for a beautiful display on a Mac. You can see how big and immersive this is. Um, however, 
As far as the display is concerned, I would definitely recommend a curve for future models. Anything that's over a 27 inch, I would definitely recommend a curve on it. I think it needs it at this point. I think it's a bit of a necessity. Um, and I definitely think that all of these extra finicky gaming conventions, these this nomenclature for FPS and racing game and all that kind of stuff, I think it was a miss. I think it's more misleading than anything. And besides, just visually looking at it, especially for somebody with a trained eye who's used to looking at, qual at different colors and comparing different uh, monitors and stuff like that, um, it's they're just bad. They're, they're just bad. They're badly calibrated, and I don't see a use case for those things. I would just take this lovely remote, which I absolutely love, and stick it on standard, and I would never change that setting after that as far as that goes. As far as the audio, the built-in audio and mic, it is absolutely not a necessity, but hey, it's a nice to have. And I actually found when I'm connecting this to my PC that it gives me the added convenience of not having to rewire my mic and, and uh, my microphones and my webcams and all that kind of stuff. I can just go straight with what's right on the monitor and I know I'm not gonna get an awful experience. And it even has what's called private mode. So it actually helps to isolate voices and, and, um, and uh, cancel out background noises, kind, kind of like a dynamic mic that I'm talking into right now. So can I recommend this? Absolutely. What I recommend is number one, take into account the size of the desk surface that you're gonna be putting this on. Make sure you're getting measurements so that it doesn't stick outside. You stick off the, the edge of your of your uh, monitorizer or your monitor stand. Uh, it might it kind of look silly. I'm definitely gonna put this on a VESA, so I'm happy about that. But can I recommend this? Absolutely. I think it's a very good monitor, but take everything I've said into consideration because in my particular use case, I think they did a great job, but for yours, maybe not so much. And I recommend checking out other options out there, something that might suit your particular use case. All right. So thank you very much for watching. Again, a huge thank you to BenQ for sending this over to me. I'm super happy with it and happy shopping. Take care.